What is accounting practice management software? Is it the operating system for your accounting practice? Is it an all-in-one software solution for accountants? Is it the crucial tech standing between your practice and utter chaos? Accounting practice management software should bring together all of your practice's mission-critical functions in one place to make your life and your practice easier. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Canopy, later in the episode. I don't know the specific numbers, but I do know there's been a trend of more and more companies are staying private longer and longer and avoiding going public because it is so expensive. It's such a hassle to do the reporting and the requirements for public company reporting have just gotten more and more onerous. So you add ESG into the mix and you might discourage even more companies from going public. And that has the unintended consequence of then exempting them from all of these SEC (laughs) regulations. Right? So you make it too hard to be public, and then you defeat the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. Coming to you weekly from the OnPay Recording Studio, this is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. I've got a fun story to kick us off this week. Fun. Accountants are voted... Yes. Accountants are voted the best kissers in Britain ahead of doctors and nurses. This was in the Daily Mail. I don't know the publications in the UK all that well, but I feel like the Daily Mail is not exactly the uh, most journalistic of publications. Our UK listeners can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I think, but I did like those this headline. Things like that, the National Enquirer, all those types of things, they tend to be the truth just two years ahead of time. <laughs> so I would put some stake <laughs> in it. Well, Yes, this surprised me. Accountants voted the best kissers ahead of doctors and nurses. Now, have you kissed an accountant? The, um, have I? No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so either. So, yeah, <laughs> not knowing. But that. I guess I'd have to go and ask. You know, if somebody became somebody an accountant after kissed. the fact. Yes, this was a poll of 2,000 Britons by the dating site Plenty of Fish. Claire Hunter of Norwich, 37, married accountant Chris after meeting in a nightclub. The coffee shop boss said, quote, I remember dancing with Chris and then going off for a snog. It was definitely the best kiss of my life, and I've not stopped kissing him since. (laughs) Some 55% of those polled said their current partner was not the best kisser they had known. A total of 11% said their most recent ex-partner had been the best. So... Accountants got 23%. Uh, now, I have a and prediction then, or, or a thought on how this happens. Right? You present people a list, and accountants are always on the top of the list, and people are lazy. And <laughs> this is why, like, if any of you have a CRM and you, for some reason, you always have way more accountants in your CRM as the industry type. Because if you give somebody a list of 50 industries, they're just like, it's too much work. They just pick the first one on the list. And then that's why you get and this, accountants. This, every, yes, accountants, appear accounting firms at the top tend because to you, of alphabetical order. Yeah, they tend to be at the top of the list. So we'd have to redo this where that list is randomly exposed. Well, now that you've questioned the validity of this survey, I don't know if I want to share more about it. Oh. But I feel like I should just okay. because it's fun. So the order is accountants, then doctors slash nurses, engineers, teachers, and waiters slash chefs. Now at the bottom of the list. The worst kissers were voted as civil servants, bankers, <laughs> lawyers, estate agents, and IT workers. IT workers were the worst at 7%. Wow. Well, maybe, maybe, I mean, here, here's how we could test this. All of you listeners can go to your spouses and you can ask them, get them to give you an honest answer if you're their best <laughs> honest, kisser. Well, I mean, and if they if they married you, like hopefully, you know, that was part of the criteria. But I don't I don't know. Maybe it's just because you have a stable job, right? That's what it is. Well, all right. Well, it is what it is. Maybe we'll find out uh, other amazing factors about accounts in the future. What do you got this week, mail. David? I have some follow up on ESG, environmental, social, and governance reporting. Yeah, tell me. So this is an article in CFO.com. And the title of the article is, How Will ESG Impact Be Measured? It's an interview with um, someone named Ronald Cohen. He's the chair of leadership council of Harvard's Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative. And he also is a co-founder of a London-based private equity firm, Apex Partners. 
So he's kind of got his fingers in uh, t- two, two things here. Mm-hmm. And his kind of goal is one of his big quotes is like, what needs, this is the quote, one of the key things that needs to be done is to develop an accounting system, a way to put monetary values on trend transgressions or successes of ESG principles. And what was interesting about this is, and some of this is like obvious, I guess, but they're trying to talk about how like um, it has to get widely adopted or mandated to be adopted, right? So no matter what you, if anybody comes up with any standards or any ideas for standards, there's going to be lobbying to get those adopted, right? Uh, Widespread. You said something though that stuck out to me, an accounting system for ESG is what he's talking about. Yes. So they are working on this at Harvard, a framework for this. But then also there's other people also working on this, other organizations. You have the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB. You have something called the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And then the big four accounting firms are also working on some sort of standards on how to account for this. So So a lot of competing standards. Yes, there's competing standards. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is this like conclu- like it's a weird conclusion. You know, they're they're saying that once this is accepted or mandated, investors are going to look at this impact on the income statements and compare those income statements against other companies' income statements when they make investments, which is like the argument we've been saying for a long time, which is like investors aren't using income statements to make investment decisions. Not right now, yeah. <laughs> so so you really just have to create the impression that your company is good with ESG to get investors, right? It doesn't actually have to be measured. Now, the really interesting thing in this Uh, is this goes on, and I thought this was really the hypocritical thing of the whole thing. At the end, it talks about the SEC, and there's a sentence. The SEC has zero jurisdiction over private enterprises. This guy is a founder of like a $50 million or $50 billion or whatever it is. So think about the hypocrisy of this. He's over here in his left hand pushing to make it very difficult for public companies to do their bookkeeping because now they got to track all this ESG crap and report on it. But private companies aren't subject to this. He just happens to own a gigantic private equity company. Mm -hmm. Like I just find it very, like he's making the free market harder for basically public companies. So that way when Tilden chooses not to be a public company anymore because it's a nightmare and Zendesk just and we're already this, right? seeing that. Zendesk just pulled back yep. and went back to private equity, and they're going to not be a public anymore. I don't know the specific numbers, but I do know there's been a trend of more and more companies are staying private longer and longer and avoiding going public because it is so expensive. It's such a hassle to do the reporting, and the requirements for public company reporting have just gotten more and more onerous. So you add ESG into the mix, and you might discourage even more companies from going public, and that has the unintended consequence of then exempting them from all of these SEC (laughs) regulations, right? So you make it too hard to be public and then you defeat the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. Hey, did you see that Tesla sold 75% of its Bitcoin holdings? Oh, I think I saw that over the last previous quarter or something, or? I don't know when they did it. It was recent. Because it was in their earnings announcement, right? So it was between the last earnings announcement and this one. So a quarter, basically. So sometime sometime last quarter, yeah. Apparently... The reason for this, that that Elon Musk says the reason is that they've had production challenges in China and they're having a cash crunch. So they need to sell the Bitcoin in order to raise cash. Could be. They sold, let's see, how much did they sell? They sold three quarters of their billion dollar stake, right? Was it a billion dollars? Yeah, it's a lot, right? So they lost money on this. I don't know how much, but they got to have lost a lot of money on it. Because if you bought it a qu- th- three months ago, yeah, you were at some of those pre-highs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, if you want to talk, touch on crypto really quickly. So the FBI warned that people are creating fake crypto apps and scamming people. Now, this is a teeny scam in the grand scheme of crypto itself, but they say there's about 277 people have lost $42.7 million. And so essentially you create an app that looks like Bank of America. You put it out there. People think it's the real Bank of America app all right, I'll buy crypto. So they spend money on crypto. It looks like it's growing in value. Then they try to withdraw the Mm. money. And this is the really genius part these guys that they're doing. Oh, if you want to withdraw the money, Blake, you got to pay some taxes. (laughs) Some people pay more money. And then the whole app just shuts down. You can't get anything out. So they they double dip from you, which is kind of genius. Um, So it's a lookalike app. It's a lookalike app. Yeah. 
Oh, so, interesting. And then I think like this is Watch just the start. And I heard an interesting podcast today, the Odd Lots podcast, and Jason Calacanis was on there. And he's like, we're, we're just probably at like the first pitch of a nine-inning baseball game of investigations and state attorney generals going after crypto people. Like when dot yeah, yeah, when, absolutely. When Web 1.0 happened and that blew up and exploded, no Web 1.0 people were on the FBI's most wanted list. Like now, there's somebody on the FBI's most wanted list, and the chances are there's going to be three or four or five crypto people on the FBI's most wanted list. Like this is going to get dirty and expose a lot of people, including probably other VCs and big funds and hedge funds who've been pumping and dumping this stuff on the consumer investor, if you want to call it that. So just kind of interesting. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. The pe- the money, the people with the money tend to get away with it because they, they're not the ones the big money. committing the yeah. fraud. Yeah. The big money never pays the price. Which is why like, they always get Martha out before. went to jail, right? It's kind of that same. Yeah. She wasn't, yeah. you know, right? That's the fun. That's the interesting one. Even though she was a celebrity, is a celebrity. She wasn't big money. Uh, FASB has scrapped their project on goodwill accounting. Listeners of the show may recall that I'm a critic of the current accounting for goodwill, which is it just sits on the books until there's some sort of event that causes it to be written off. So they were going to and reassess how it should be accounted for or what was the plan? No, not how it should be accounted. Well, this is was my criticism is that it wasn't about the project wasn't to figure out like if we should change how to account for goodwill, it was to figure out what to do with it. So currently goodwill sits on the balance sheet and then there's an impairment analysis that happens and perhaps it gets impaired annually. And there was this argument that we should move back to the old method, which was amortize it over time. So it just gets written down over time every year over a period of whatever years, 30 years, who knows? There was a time there's a, you know, it's an arbitrary amount of time, but they've just like given up on that. That was actually something that was reported in June. They may return to it at some point. Like, I wonder what are they so busy with doing that they can't deal with this goodwill thing? Because the goodwill issue just keeps getting bigger. Well, there's more and more goodwill on corporate balance sheets. And there's actually quite a few companies in the Fortune 500 where if they had to write off all their goodwill, it would give them negative equity. Yeah, I think I just saw Amazon right. acquired that doctor's office yesterday. And that's another $4 billion. That's eventually, a lot of that's probably going to go on Amazon's balance sheet as goodwill. Like, as goodwill, just, yeah. And and it's because, it's because we don't have good accounting for intangible assets. And so when you acquire a company with a lot of intangibles, it just goes into goodwill. This is evidence that accounting standards have not kept up with the digital economy intangible assets, the knowledge economy. Well, instead of like, solving like, that, we're solving how to account for ESG. Right, right. So that's right. It We're totally looking at this shiny object over here, ESG, and not focusing on the real problem, which is intangibles. And ESG is like an intangible, actually, It's <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's a small piece of all of that. Maybe we could solve both here, Blake. When you how? have crappy SG scores, we deduct your goodwill. And maybe we solve for both at the same time. (laughs) This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Lysio. I have to admit, I love email. But as soon as I'm in the zone, heads down, focused, working on a task, something may require me to go look at a related email to the task at hand. I jump over, open my inbox, and just like that, I get distracted and derailed by hundreds of other unrelated emails. By the time I find the email I was looking for, I've wasted a half hour or more. If you and your team are still using email to communicate with your clients, I suspect you have a story similar to mine. Even if you don't, using email with your clients is probably a bad idea. It's like sending postcards back and forth. Anyone can read, not very secure. And let's admit it, clients are probably ignoring your emails anyways. Maybe it's time to move all your client communications out of your email inbox and into Lysio. Lysio allows you to have secure, real-time communications with your clients via a mobile app that includes reminders, task management, e-signatures, document scanning and uploading, and unlimited storage. If you are ready to significantly improve your staff's focus, collaboration, and relationships with clients, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Lysio. 
That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash L-I-S-C-I-O. Here's another accounting story, accounting standard story. I always love it when accounting methodology gets into a headline in a major publication. Wall Street Journal reported, inflation puts spotlight on companies' use of last in, first out accounting. And this took me back to my accounting classes when I learned about the two different methods of the two major methods of inventory sure. costing. You've got FIFO, first in, last out. I know. <laughs> You've got FIFO, first in, first out. So the inventory that you bought earliest is what you use first for costing when you sell, right? So it's the oldest stuff, right? It gets, gets used. Last in, first out, it's the newest stuff gets used for costing. And in an inflationary environment, that can have vastly different values because under LIFO, you're using the latest stuff you bought, which has the highest price. So LIFO is really good at showing lower profits in an inflationary environment. Right? You, yeah. you, have, you have higher cost inventory because it's the most recent inventory you bought. And that's what you're using for your cost of goods. So you show lower margins, which is good for not financial reporting, but for tax purposes. Yes. So there's all these companies in the US that use LIFO because they want to have low taxes. They want to show less profit for lower taxes. And it shows this uh, disconnect between wanting to show profits in your financial statements and to show that you're a profitable company, but also not wanting to do that because if you do that, you have to pay taxes. And if I remember correctly from way back in you know, accounting 101, 102, it kind of, after a few years, it all averages itself back out, right? Right. So in the there, there, this is all just accounting that has no impact on cash flow. So it has nothing yes, to do yeah, with how yeah, the exactly. business is actually yeah. operating. Yeah. It's just a arbitrary way of allocating costs. Yeah. Cost accounting. Right. So that's why it's really important to understand the inventory costing method that a company uses when you look at their financial statements, because depending on the economic environment, it can have a huge difference in their profits. And then that's the... So Kroger, goes to like, here's an example. Go, 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 the, 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 the example cited in the article is Kroger, the grocery store chain. They said that they took a 93 million LIFO charge during the quarter ended in May 21, compared with a 37 million LIFO charge in the year earlier period. But sales rose 8%. So sales went up 8% and the cost... Of the inventory went up how much? So ninety th from thirty seven million to ninety three million. So two x. Wow. But yeah, more right, way more. They're going to take a full year life of charge of three hundred million this year compared with a one hundred ninety seven million life of charge during the prior year, and that's all due to inflation. So it's going to take from their profits, even though there was no economic impact. Like it's just an accounting method. Yeah. I mean, obviously the inflation affects their costs and their profits, right? But it's – it's. So do you think when there's an article they, like this, like you said, it's kind of the mainstream article and they're, they start using accounting jargon, do you think the average person reading this is even knows what they're talking about? <laughs> or, or, or is the average person like, oh, well, yeah, I remember this LIFO, FIFO stuff from Accounting 101 and they just stop reading the article entirely. They just move on with their lives. <laughs> right. I don't know. It's, it's Wall Street Journal, right? So it's already a niche audience, okay. I think. Anyway, repealing LIFO in the U.S., right, which you can only use in the U.S., not in uh, international accounting standards, it would raise about a billion dollars in annual tax revenue. So that's how much it saves wow. companies. And that's why it's stuck around for so long. It's because of, you know, lobbying. Eva, uh, did you see EY had a payroll problem? <laughs> yes. Uh, 55,000 EY employees had their paychecks Deposited and then withdrawn due to a processing error at ADP. Yeah. And it's easy to happen. Remember we talked about the my payroll fraud? Or my what was that company? My my payroll HR. My payroll HR had the big fraud because it's just ACH. And these ACH it's very easy to like put money in and pull money out. It doesn't take much. These ACH files are just CSV files. And mm -hmm. that's probably something that happened. Something got uploaded the wrong way. And cause the money get pulled out of all these people's accounts. What's interesting is the sentence in this article. So this is the article from Accounting Today. 
And it said, in some cases, the problems may have led to overdrafts on some of EY's employees' bank accounts. Like, are, are EY's employees paid that, like, they're paycheck to paycheck? Like, they're paid, I mean, obviously they have different range of employees that give different wages, but geez, EY, pay your employees so they have enough, they have an emergency fund that they're not overdrawing their accounts. Well, this is the thing that always kind of shocked me, the stat that I have a hard time believing, but I do believe because I've seen it in many, many studies. It's that a lot of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So I just Googled this because this stat comes up all the time. CNBC reported that 61% of Americans are still living paycheck to paycheck as of February 17th, 2022. Nearly two thirds of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, and it's it's not just among like low earners; it's all across the board. People tend to use the money they have; they spend it. It's like human nature to spend all your money. And everything's stacked against you, right? As soon as you think you're turning a corner financially, you, know, you get married and blow a bunch of money. Then you turn a corner, and then next thing you know, you have some kids. And like every time you think you have a cushion, it just gets blown. And it takes you a while to build it back up again, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a story about remote work, which we haven't talked about in a little while. McKinsey did a study that got widely reported recently about is remote work effective? And the headline is, is remote work effective? We finally have the data. So David, what do you think? Do you think remote work is effective? So you said this is a study by McKinsey. Yes. Now, was this on their own or was this a paid for study from somebody else? I don't see... I don't see like a branding on this report or anything like that. And I feel like if it was done for somebody else. But McKenzie makes their money by consulting and advising big, huge corporations. Yes. And my guess is big, huge corporations want people in the office. So I'm going to say that their survey somehow reflects some data that is not effective to work remotely. That's my guess. (laughs) Well, well, let's dig into this and see. So how many people can work from home? This survey says that 35% of job holders can work from home full-time and 23% can do so part-time. So that means 58%, the equivalent of 92 million people in the United States, can work remotely at least part of the time. some flexibility in there, yeah. Yes. Now, when offered, almost everyone takes the opportunity to work flexibly. 87% of employees like getting to work remotely and take that option. Most employees want flexibility, but the averages hide the critical differences. There's remarkable consistency among people of different genders, ethnicities, ages, and educational and income levels. The vast majority of those who can work from home do so. However, the opportunity is not uniform. There was a large difference in the number of employed men who say they were offered remote working opportunities and women. At every income level, younger workers were more likely than older workers to report having work from home opportunities. So men... 61% of men got remote work opportunities, but only 52% of women. That's interesting. Wow. Actually, that's... Yeah. That's a significant difference. Now, obviously, this will come as no surprise. Most industries support some flexibility, but digital innovators demand it. So, like, if you're in a computer or mathematical occupation, it's like the vast majority of, of people get to work remotely. Like it's over half can work remotely full time. Yeah, if, if if everything you do is on a computer, you're 100 yeah. percent on a computer. It is very hard to make an argument why you can't just work anywhere. And so you're right. As the employees of that skill set, those mm-hmm. knowledge workers are going to demand it. I could see that. So business slash financial operations, which I can't tell exactly if accounting falls into that, but I don't see another category in this report that fits it. 61 percent can work full time remotely. That's like, that's enormous, right? And then 25% part-time. A flexible working arrangement is a top three motivator for finding a new job. So it goes in terms of motivation for a new job, greater pay or hours, then better career opportunities, and then flexible working arrangement, such as working remotely. But the greater pay, by the way, is by far 47% said that's like the important thing to them. 21% said flexible working in terms of, you know, how important that is yeah. as being your like top. There's factors affecting ability to effectively perform work. 
So did they say that they're more productive? Is, is, are you still getting to this? But I don't. I'm actually not finding that in the survey. <laughs> it's just the headline. You got clickbaited in by the headline. Well, they that was the headline. I'm so confused. I thought I thought they had this in the survey. I mean, I guess the fact that so many people are working remotely and that like you know the world hasn't fallen apart <laughs> proves that it's effective. Maybe it's no better. Maybe it's just equal. Maybe there is no argument here. Maybe it it just doesn't really matter. <laughs> It truly is just flexible. Well, I feel silly. I feel silly now that I asked you that question, and then I didn't have actual like data on that. Thank you so much, clickbait uh, headline. <laughs> it's okay by McKinsey without the, without the answer. Should we get into app news, or Go do you ahead. have anything else outside apps? Oh, we could transition, right? Like zero comments. Well, this so week. we could quick. Yeah, we'll transition to that. Mm-hmm. And it, but quick follow up, just so I can get it off my list. Accounting firms taking private equity investment. Follow up on that. Cherry Bakert. Top 25 firm based in Richmond, Virginia, became the latest accounting firm to receive private equity funding with a strategic investment Thursday for an undisclosed sum from Parthenon Capital, a PE firm based in Boston. So they now join... Who are are the other ones that got PE investment? It's getting to the point where I don't remember. Eisner Amper and Citroen Cooperman. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know this. In January, Parthenon acquired RSM's wealth management practice, but they didn't take any other piece of RSM. So I, 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 the trend continues on that. Uh, and then PPP fraud follow up. Two U.S. attorneys are investigating Cabbage's PPP lending. So we speculated that due to all the PPP fraud, eventually the fintechs would get targeted for investigations yeah. because a lot of the fraud went through the fintechs yeah, and not through the banks. Because the problem with the banks was they were too slow and they were not approving loans for people who weren't already customers. So all those people who weren't already customers, which included fraudsters, went to the fintechs. Okay. And Cabbage was one of the largest PPP lenders. They did so well that it got them acquired by American Express. Well, even that, that company out of Scottsdale didn't even exist until March of the pandemic. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, yeah. Billions, billions. So, and that was the, the money so, and, they and made, our, their revenue, not the amount of loans they gave out. Yeah. So how did this come out? Cabbage disclosed in a Florida lawsuit that it is under investigation by U.S. attorneys in Massachusetts and the Eastern District of Texas for its PPP lending practices. These investigations are being coordinated by the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Division. And... There's a quote here from Ben Curtis, the former assistant chief of the criminal division fraud section at the DOJ. Anytime you have two U.S. attorneys' offices that have separately drawn the same inferences based on evidence that reached them from independent sources, it's not a really good sign. And he said that it's unusual that this was disclosed in a civil investigation. This was disclosed um, in public because civil investigations usually aren't public. So just thinking out loud, like, like, what are they guilty of? Are they guilty of just not having good due diligence and not having good controls and guidelines in place? Or is there something else going on here where they actually targeted and encouraged? You remember how the the big, the loan bust in 2008 when they were, hey, we'll help you. Like, yeah, you just just write on that line how much income you got and we'll give you a loan. Do you think there's those types of practices were happening? And that's where they're, they've done – because then that means they've done something criminal if there's those practices. But but if they didn't have good due diligence, like why would they, the state general attorney generals be going after them? Do you follow me? So the question is whether or not Cabbage followed the guidelines for approving PPP loans. So the PPP program required lenders, even Cabbage, which was not a bank, to establish robust anti-money laundering and customer due diligence programs. Which – Going back to last week, we talked about those those that payments got the founders of that payments company were going after because they were letting all this fraud go to Nigeria, go through their app. Okay, right, gotcha. Just know your customer, yeah. right? You got to like do due diligence. Well, Cabbage has been linked to nearly one in five federal PPP fraud pr- prosecutions to date. Twenty percent of all the fraud prosecutions for PPP are linked to Cabbage. So the question is, you know, did Cabbage do enough to to know who they were giving these loans out to. And I think it's arguable that they didn't. 
if you could just go into a form, fill out some information, and then it was automatically approved with no verification, which it seems like, given the volume they were doing, maybe that was happening. Well, because there were stories, right? Well, like of a, in a, a zip code in Chicago where there was only like 18 actual registered businesses, <laughs> like 110, yeah, all, of all in sharing... the same building, right? All in the same same yeah. apartment building. They all got, they all created an entity and got a loan. Yeah. Yeah. So this will get fought out in the courts basically. It's like, did they follow the rules or not? And it's probably going to be a fine print kind of thing. And it'll depend on what a judge or a jury thinks. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Canopy. Accounting practices management software should bring together all of your firm's mission critical functions in one place. Client management, document management, workflow, time and billing, and payments to keep your team organized. Canopy knows that not all firms are on the same practice management journey or timeline, so Canopy lets you build your practice management platform as you need it. You start with the client management as your foundation, then you can choose the modules that your firm needs. Since nobody likes paying for modules they don't use, they offer modular pricing as well. Canopy integrates with QuickBooks Online, Xero, FreshBooks, CRMs, Form Builders, Spreadsheets, Calendars, Email, and Zapier. They have a mobile app, centralized file management, fillable PDFs, a client portal, task management, and the list goes on and on. Via their integration with the IRS, you can easily retrieve all your clients' transcripts, notices, and childcare tax credit payments without leaving Canopy. To try Canopy free for 30 days, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Canopy. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-A-N-O-P-Y. It's time to streamline your firm with Canopy. All right, shall we move into app news? Let's do that. And we'll start with a report from our global correspondent, Heather Smith, who attended ZeroCon London, which was this week. It must have been hot there, right? Like, that's what I've been hearing about the UK. Super hot. It's hot everywhere. Here we go. Hello, Blake and David and the fabulous Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners. It's Heather Smith, your favorite roving reporter here, and I'm coming to you from London ZeroCon. After 980 days, ZeroCon is back. To celebrate, Mother Nature threw in an additional challenge of record-breaking scorching high temperatures. For me, at 11 p.m. the night before traveling to ZeroCon, I received an email that my train ticket had been cancelled and all trains after 7 a.m. to London were cancelled. Challenge accepted. Like many ZeroCon attendees, I had the most bizarre journey to ZeroCon. Um, mine involved running through a country lane for about two kilometres at 5 a.m. in the morning with luggage in tow and then hitchhiking to the train station once I'd hit a main road. So let's talk about product announcements. What were the product updates from Zeracon? All of the um, product updates really seem to be UK-centric. They were either not available outside of the UK yet or the functionality that for me we already had in Australia, so it's being rolled out here in the UK. Zerigo um, is a new freemium app made specifically for sole traders for your clients who are too small for standard Zero solution. It's aimed at the massive and growing gig and side hustle economy. I recall a decade ago, Rod Drury saying to me, if you're building an app, the first layer of people who will pay for it are small business. So I think it's an expected move to sweep up the massive micro business market. Matt Paff shared on Twitter that it was part of his 2018 BizTech predictions. Zerigo is currently free to download on Apple, but not yet available on Android solutions, so I've not been able to try it out. After the 31st of uh, March 2023, it will be £4 sterling a month. It offers expense tracking, simple reporting, the ability to connect with the accountants platform with optional paid ons ava add-ons available. I'm not across UK tax requirements, but it seems that it will enable UK sole traders to comply with UK Making Tax Digital for Income Tax Self-Assessment Regime in 2024. Currently, Zero Go is the only available in the UK. Maybe um, something similar will be announced in New Orleans next month. Who knows? Another announcement was Zero and Go Cardless are offering instant bank pay for UK customers. It seemed like a, a pretty neat 
solution offering there. Other updates um, brought their offerings in line with what we already had in Australia around practice solutions. Um, Xero are retiring the older version of reports. Uh, new reports has been in Xero has been around for years. I was writing about um, how to use them, how to create managed reports using new reports in the third edition of Xero for Dummies. And the fifth edition of Zero for Dummies has just been released, and I think we removed all reference to old-style reporting. New reports are robust. They have far more flexibility options. I find personally I sometimes get confused with how to save them because I'm so used to working in G Suite that saves instantly. But other than that, they, 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 they do have a lot of offerings. Um, I'd also like to mention I was grateful for the opportunity to meet with Anna Curzon, Chief Product Officer at Zero. So Blake and David, as some of your listeners may be aware, I've been focusing my attentions and have been pushing for a single core product feature request now for over five years. Xero recently uh, relaunched their product ideas platform and relevant and existing feature requests were brought across into the new platform and my request um, was also brought across into that platform and it is reconciliation. The ability to reconcile, clearing, control and non-bank accounts in Xero. I shared this with Anna, what the feature request was, what were the timely and cumbersome workarounds and the benefit of having the functionality of being able to reconcile or mark off all accounts, all of your accounts. So you're reconciling to the balance sheet. So hopefully um, that conversation um, um, will push the feature request a little bit further up the ladder. So, well, so long, cheerio, and farewell from Britain um, and my updates from ZeroCon London. So this is Heather Smith signing off and I look forward to seeing you all in New Orleans next month. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. Yeah, I wish we were going to ZeroCons all around the world. I know, right? We've got to figure out how to get ourselves out there. Although, you know, now that I've been at home for like two years, I'm, I kind of like it. I don't, I don't like traveling like I used to. She mentioned the, how hot it was. Mm -hmm. QuickBooks Connect was in London um, 2018, I think, April of 2018. And that's when they had that crazy cold weather where it snowed at the Vatican, it snowed in Rome, and it was re and it snowed in London, which it only does like once every 30 years. So it's funny that the just bad luck of both conferences had the like coldest day in history in London and then like the hottest day, one of the hottest days in history in London. It's kind of kind of interesting. Well, well, ZeroCon in the US is happening in New Orleans in uh, August. So we're going to give London a run for its money in terms of the <laughs> how it feels temperature. Yes. Humidity will be there. Yeah. Specifically, what else the, do you have in app news this well, week? Well, specifically, David? Uh, just to touch on the um, self-employed product. First, I'd say I do like that name Zero Go for the self-employed product because if you think about it, like QuickBooks has it, it's called QuickBooks Self-Employed, and they're in the UK. But the thing is, it's a little bit clutter, uh, a crowded market there because you know Dext has a self. So Dext, you know, um, mm -hmm. formerly Receipt Bank, they have a self-employed product in the UK. I don't know if you knew this oh. or not. Yeah, so it's a GL. It, 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 it's a GL. Yeah. I think it even um, has a, a spend card, right? It connects in with mm -hmm. uh, bank feeds. Yeah, they kind of have a, a product just targeting self employed. So it's a, it's kind of a little bit crowded there, but there maybe there's room. There's 2.6 million sole traders, they call them in the UK. So there's probably some room in there. We've got an update from Microsoft Excel. It's a name that caught my attention Excel Live. Announcing Excel Live, transform Microsoft team meetings with real-time collaboration. And there's a short video. I'm going to play the video, and then I'll try to describe it for the listeners who aren't watching this on YouTube. Okay. And you, David. Excel Live delivers a new way to collaborate in real time during Teams meetings. When you select an Excel file from the share tray, it doesn't just share the screen for others to see. It allows attendees to collaborate with the Excel file right from the meeting itself. The view will follow the presenter, but you can also interact, explore, and simply sync back to the presenter view to rejoin the discussion. The best part is that you can easily edit the Excel file right from the meeting window without anyone having to leave the meeting screen or open the file separately. 
And just like with PowerPoint Live, you can also initiate the same experience directly from Excel by clicking Share, followed by the Work Together in Teams option. So, so can I summarize what I think I just heard? Yes. Right. Normally, I have a spreadsheet and I want to share it, either Google Sheet or Excel. And I got to like open up Excel or Google Sheets, go to the sharing, invite you to share the doc, and then you can edit and do whatever you want. And previously, when I've been in meetings, I'm like, oh, oh, wait, you have to pause what you're doing in the meeting, go invite the people that are in that meeting so they can see the doc. Basically, if I'm in a Microsoft Teams meeting, instantly, anybody in that meeting is just going to get access to the doc when I open it, kind of, or share the screen. And I think it's just for that meeting. It makes the screen share interactive for them. Which is genius. It could go on and off. And then after that meeting, they don't need access to it anymore. And that I'm not clear on. Okay. Does it does sharing it in the meeting give them access permanently or is it just temporary? But it is nice, right? It saves a lot of time as opposed to having to drop the link in and share it. And then somebody, that's what would happen is we'd share the document and then somebody would share their screen so that we can all see what everyone's doing in one place. But this, the, Or you'd like, forget you'd to, to unshare it, it after screens. and all these things. Like if, yeah. if, if sharing gets a little bit more smarter like that, like this, this could be a start of a trend for lots of things. Yeah. yeah, I thought that Cause, was good. Because you could share like a, a Slack channel or a Teams channel and everybody in that channel has access yeah. to the doc, but then you forget to kick somebody out of the channel or they or you kick them out of the channel. They're no longer part of that channel, but they still have access to the doc. Like, yeah, if they could tie the permissions of things to the work you're doing, it's mm. a very interesting concept. I love that idea. So Microsoft actually was in another news article. So this article is on Enterprise Times. It's Sage deepens Microsoft partnership and unveils Sage Active. And unveils is in quotes. So I click on the article, you read it all the thing, and essentially the article does not talk about anything of what the hell Sage Active is. So that's why the title of the article has this in quotes. Because you don't know what this product is. Like, what is Sage Active? Right. So it's like a product announcement, but then there's nothing about the product. It's like an interview just with the name. executive. I don't know. It's just like, it's got, it's got like the typical, like why you would do something on Microsoft because, you know, it's reliable. It's runs on Azure and it's productive, but like the actual product itself, this new thing. Right. Nobody talks about. <laughs> so we'll keep an eye on that. I'll, I'll watch for Sage Active. Maybe I have an update, but I just thought it was really funny that they didn't really announce anything. Yeah. 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 This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Relay Financial. For those listeners that haven't been following along with my drama caused by PNC when they purchased BBVA and botched the migration, to quickly summarize, PNC bank feeds wouldn't work with QuickBooks Online, the website had all my old BBV transactions just listed as debits and credits with no vendors or payees, and to top it all off, the June bank statement was just missing, like June never happened. Let's just say my 2021 books were a mess. So for 2022, I made the commitment to stop using PNC and switch everything to Relay. Relay is a no-fee online banking platform built for you and your small business clients. Relay understands and solves all the things we as accountants and bookkeepers care about. Security, bank feeds, automation, reconciliation. I invited both my interns to my Relay account. They created their own user ideas and passwords, and within minutes, they were using Relay to create virtual debit cards, physical debit cards, download statements, and reconciling. Now, the bank feeds in my QuickBooks Online are reliable and my 2022 books are in order. To stop fighting with an unreliable bank that doesn't care about you or your small business clients, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash relay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash R-E-L-A-Y. Well, FreshBooks has a new feature that accountants who have clients on FreshBooks will appreciate. You can now customize your chart of accounts in FreshBooks more easily. So that means that you can take their default chart of accounts and you can now change the structure. You have the ability to customize the parent and sub account structure, create, edit, and archive accounts, reorder cost of goods sold and operating expense accounts, and then track more details for each account with a customizable account number and account description. That's one of those things that we've been asking for for a long time. So great that they did that. Well, it's interesting because you think about like Intuit and QuickBooks is kind of starting to swing the pendulum the other way of you're not allowed to customize. The, the, the dream is to not let people customize that chart of accounts because it allows you to do way better automation at a grand scale in QuickBooks. It's kind of interesting to see the pendulum yeah. swinging depending who the app is and what they want to let people do and not do. What I've always wanted as an accountant, as a bookkeeper, is the ability 
for me to lock it down so that my clients can't add new accounts and can't change the accounts. Like once I've set it up for them, they should ask me to do it. And too often in the small business accounting systems, you can't lock it down like that. And then they go and they make a bunch of accounts throughout the year. And then you've got to go do all the cleanup yeah, yeah. later. Especially if yeah. they, in a lot of, and sometimes you get going too fast. And even in QuickBooks Online, I'll do it sometimes where you you create a second account on accident. And then you forget to take yeah, it out. Exactly. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just, because it's trying to quick fill or whatever it's doing, right? And I think I've done even our yep. zero instance. I've created an account mm -hmm. mistakenly on accident. Next one. There's an article about um, Adaptive, a company called Adaptive. They raised $6.5 million to optimize accounting for enterprises. Um, title was so kind of This is not weird. Adaptive Insights. No, this is- a, This is a different Adaptive. So the article is actually incorrect of who they link to. It's actually, <laughs> the company is Adaptive.Build. Dot build. Oh, they fixed it. Are you looking at the TechCrunch article? Uh, this was an uh, enterprise talk. Was the oh, okay? The website. Never mind. So they linked to the wrong adaptive. They linked to the wrong adaptive. So it's adaptive dot build. And so I went out there to look at it, and it's kind of interesting. It kind of looks like an auto entry slash dex type product, like scanning of bills, right? Mm -hmm. But also it has payments of bills, so similar to a bill dot com or a Melio, right? But what it does is it's because it's for construction all the job costing and the classes and all that detailed stuff you need from a construction app, that's their kind of sweet spot. They're kind of getting into that, that area. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, in, it's interesting one to look at. What I also was interesting about this raise is it talks about how well-known financial technology startup executives from Airbase, Brex, and Ramp. So these are all like kind of three competing companies, right? For expense management. But all three of those products have also in the last year year and a half have introduced bill pay and bills. So my guess is these people are at these companies and realizing, oh, our products are not a good fit for construction. So when they saw an opportunity to invest in an app that's good at scanning construction bills, right? It's the typical thing. You go to Home Depot, it's great if you can scan the receipt for Home Depot, but the receipt for Home Depot might be for six jobs. And how do you get that accounted for properly in the accounting system? And this is this is the type mm -hmm. of stuff this app mm -hmm. adapted. It's called Adaptive Real Estate Inc. is actually the company, but it's easier. Just it's adaptive dot build is the, is the actual website. NetSuite has a new inventory solution, a new inventory counting solution, as well as improvements to its analytics warehouse. NetSuite Smart Count allows for automated inventory counts, which can even be conducted live without having to freeze transactions. If activity does happen during a count, then the software will alert the counter, who can then take appropriate actions. The embedded NetSuite product, which integrates with its existing inventory management solution, supports the following additional features. And there's a lot of features here. You can go read the article on accounting today if you want all the details. And then they also announced improvements to their already existing NetSuite analytics data warehouse. Uh, new features include a bunch of detailed stuff that I'm sure the analytics folks who are into that will really appreciate. And uh, that caught my eye because we're attending Sweet World in Las Vegas in September, as we did last year, and we're going to get to talk with NetSuite executives and learn about updates on the product and meet customers. It'll be fun. And it'll be interesting to see their uh, dynamic on the show floor. Because I think last year, one of the observations was there was no payroll people because they introduced their own payroll as part of the suite. And last year, they launched bill pay. So it'll be interesting to see if there's any bill pay apps on the show floor this Will year. Will they? Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to be honest, like, I, I love that. Oracle NetSuite cares about our show and brings us out there, but I do think it's a bad idea to block folks from your marketplace because they have a product that overlaps with your core features or your your modules. I mean, if 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 they follow that forever, then eventually there will be no third party apps at well. Hence the goal of the suite, because, right? That's kind of their yeah. their play on that. Everything will be part of the yeah. suite. That's kind of a their play. I have some. Uh, remember, we some follow up on. Uh, Intuit in India. Uh -huh. So, it, well, Intuit pulled QuickBooks out of India for the Indian market. That's correct. And they actually, so they've now have a kind of a blog post about this a little bit. It was dated July 20th, 2022. It's on the QuickBooks uh, blog, quickbooks.intuit.com. They've actually, uh, b based on listening to feedback from customers, they're now extending the date to April 30th of 2023. And I think that was because the most Indian companies have a different 
f- there's like year, a, a then... timeline deadline they had to they had to yeah. Um, so as of July 1st, no new signups to QuickBooks products in India. And this is going to apply to all subscriptions. So it's QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Online Accountant, the QuickBooks Mobile App, and QuickBooks Time. So all those products are being pulled out. They link out to a uh, Indian government site that links to a page that um, supposedly has free accounting software solutions. But the page crashed or never opened for me. I couldn't get. The, I couldn't actually navigate to the page. It kept timing out. So I don't know where that goes. And then there's an article from mmcconvert.com. And they're a company that specializes in converting from other accounting systems into QuickBooks Online. And they had a blog post. And, and, and I mean, to some extent, the blog post title is, Why did Intuit decide to stop offering QuickBooks in India? And I thought this was going to be like this really good take. <laughs> and I read the article and it really just throws out two reasons. Like one is that... The market in India is very competitive and Intuit didn't really want to try to compete with these other accounting systems because a lot of these other accounting systems are just coming in at a lower price. And then the second reason why is Intuit just wants to focus on other countries. So there weren't mind-blowing revelations here. Right. But just the last piece of India news, Zoho, which is basically starting to become the alternative now for people in India. Zoho just- I think it's really already big and like Zoho- dominated the market in India, right? Well, it's built in India. It kind of dominates, um, but they're, Zoho's big in the States and it's big in, in Europe. So Zoho is decently sized, but it's a suite of products. See, that's so strange right? for me. It's it's really strange to me about Zoho. Like I have a question about this, David. So like, I don't know anyone who uses Zoho as their GL. You mean accountants and bookkeepers? So where is, yeah. So where are they big? So is it like- So there's a lot of small businesses that use it. Because they have a suite, right? Use the Zoho CRM. It's like 60 apps. Right. So, right. That I understand. So, people that don't want to spend the money on QuickBooks or Xero mm-hmm. or probably an accountant probably wind up getting Zoho books, right? Mm-hmm. They kind of fall into that, that group. Now, with that said, like Zoho, I mean, we've seen them at the accounting conferences. They're starting to, um, you know, embrace accountants more. They're starting to show like the suite because they have expense tracking. I mean, you have this whole tech stack built together and built in. But anyways, another announcement. Zoho, they are actually going to hire 2,000 more employees in India across engineering, technology, product mm. development to expand you know, there and around the world. Amazing. David, I think that's all the time we have for app news because I have two listener messages. One is a voicemail from Donnie Shimamoto, friend of the show, guest on frequent guest on podcasts yep. and prolific presenter. So I'd like to get to that. And then we have a, an email that I received. Perfect. So let's hear from Donnie first. Hi, Blake and David. Donnie here. You know, after listening to the last three weeks of your podcast, I really felt compelled to call in. I think you're really missing the point on the abortion issue. The key point of the pro-lifers is that every life should be saved. Their argument isn't about what produces the better outcome or economics that's saving lives, regardless of the other impacts. While I agreed with a lot of what you presented in the abortion episode, I think you wasted your time because your arguments wouldn't have swayed any pro-lifers to your side. Along the same lines, I'm increasingly feeling like you're preaching to the choir on a lot of issues. I think many of us listening to your podcast are the more forward thinkers in the profession, and those that are not probably don't listen to your podcast. So I'm going to echo Byron Patrick's request that you stop pontificating so much and just get to the news. That's really why we all started listening to your podcast, and there's less and less of the actual news episode after episode. Finally, I had to laugh when you and David said that you guys were rejected by the ASCBS press. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I feel like you guys are infotainment and more infor- entertainment than serious press, you know, kind of like the Inquirer. Uh, If you guys try and pick up stories and angles that are going to cause controversy or make people go ooh and ah, like real press actually have fact checkers and often you're not presenting the real facts, but your opinions and the rare exception being the abortion episode and maybe a few others. Another example of this is that your discussion of the PPP loans and whether there should have been more restrictions and applications approvals versus the fraud that was found afterward. It felt like for a few episodes, you'd be saying, why are they making it so hard to get the loans? And then you found a fraud story. And then you guys are like, hey, look, these people are committing all these frauds. Why aren't they catching them? And then another article would come out about people complaining that they can't get loans. And then you're back on the, they should make it easier to get loans. Like, choose a side. Real press reporters, you know, they focus on the facts and they don't waver back and forth with what 
whatever will create the most sensational story. All right, I'll get off my own soapbox now. Thanks for letting me share some honest feedback with you, and I look forward to hearing more real news on future podcasts. Take care, guys. You know, live reaction, David. Tell me how you feel. All right, so live reaction, I mean, there's a lot to digest there. Um, A, yes, we're a news commentary, right? Like we commentary on the news, so we don't make the news. Occasionally we have, we broke some stories that other people did not break, but we are bringing our years of experience in knowledge to the space. Now, right. sometimes yes. the articles are fraud. Like the PPP has evolved over time on the way that that has gone. And obviously our opinions have evolved over time, but I wouldn't say like going to the abortion stuff, like we didn't create that to try to change people's minds, but like that was never an intention, no. right? That was not the no. intention in yeah. any way, shape or form. So I don't know how to respond to that. And then the whole, like the argument that only like forward thinkers are listening to us. I don't think that's true. Like I, I know, a, we know a lot of people that are forward thinkers in this industry, people like Donnie, but every time I go to a conference, I get more and more people I've never met before that come up and say, they listen to the show. So I don't know, yeah. like if we, if we want to make a show just for like the thought leaders of accounting, great. We'll have 200 listeners and like, we're not making that show. <laughs> we could, but I don't want to make that. Yeah. Show. Yeah. I think you had a good point, David, about us being not news, but news commentary. And that's a big difference. If we were just reporting the news, then we'd be accounting today, or we would be. We could literally CPA word for word advisor. read press releases. <laughs> like, word right. for word, word. Which is what they do. They just publish a lot of press releases in a lot yeah. of cases, right? If funny enough, they don't actually do a ton of original reporting. They just take press releases and issue those and do, I mean, they do some good stuff, right? But a lot, you know, a lot of the original reporting comes from like Wall Street Journal. Those are real news. I don't claim to be anything like that. And a lot of this is us reading the story and then reacting to it. And connecting it to opinion. the other pieces of the other stories that are in this yes. space. Because a lot of these things are all, yeah. they're kind of tied together. You just can't take a press release yeah. and be like, that's the news story, then move on to the next news story. These things are very connected yeah. and dynamic. And the reason I wanted to start doing this show is because I feel like there isn't a lot of independent news commentary. Like before we started doing this four years ago, could you even name somebody who's doing news commentary in the accounting space? It was basically all of the commentary, all of the opinion came from the AICPA, the state associations, the leaders of firms in our profession. It was all top down people who are entrenched in the, what I would call the accounting establishment. And we are independent as much as we can be <laughs> while still making a living. Luckily, we've been able to, over the last year, become fully independent. You know, in, in, like we don't, we, we are no longer employed by app companies. So now we can speak freely, more freely about, you know, how we feel about the situation in, in our profession and what's going on both with technology and in the profession. So like, no, I'm not going to just report the news. That is not what is necessary. I could, you can just, you can go read stories online, right? You don't need me to tell you what's happening. You can just get but, a feed reader. I, I could just even look at our PPP coverage. Like we were some of the first people questioning where this money was public at all. And I set up that like PPP fail loan site or whatever. And we we're getting 15,000 yeah. views a day. Then six, seven weeks later, the mainstream media finally picked up on the PPP money and the distribution and the claims that SBA was making and all that. But what we really like, did because of that, early on, I think the uh, AICPA, Erica Eggerson, right? He came on and I forgot who was, was it Mark Hoizo? They both came on and yeah. they about to talk about the the loan process, right? And their take and what their knowledge the ICPA had in this, right? And remember, there was problems with the fees and accounts were getting the fees and the recommendations and there's a lot going on. But what really came yeah. out of this was because we were out there pushing the narrative. And to some extent, we were the only ones talking about it. We were controlling the narrative. But what came out of this is the AICPA now does a weekly webinar and publishes it a podcast. And they'd be doing it every single week because they weren't out there having the conversation. And our behaviors mm -hmm. and the way we reacted to PPP loan has gotten the AICPA to do one of the, probably the best things they're doing right now. I don't know if you listen to that. I probably, every other week, I kind of, I download it and listen to it on my, as a podcast. I don't actually watch the webinars, but it's actually 
them being in touch with their members in a very yeah. good modern way. And that is the direct yeah. result of us. They would not have done that if they weren't so pissed off at us ripping on <laughs> the, their, their, their part in the failures of the PPP. But it's good because now everybody's getting a benefit if you're a member of the ICPA. They do yeah. this every single week. They put out a decent summary of content of what's going on in their world now. So I don't want to say that, like, I don't want to discount Donnie's opinion here. Yeah. I like, Donnie, if you're listening, like, I value your opinion. And I know that we won't always agree. And I just want to talk about what people want to hear about. I want to be talking about what's interesting to our listeners. So hopefully, like what we've been talking about kept our listeners interested enough for a whole hour to listen to this. And now you're at this point here. And, and I want to say to you, to our listeners who are still here, hey, if you think we should be talking about something else, tell us. If you think that what we're talking about is relevant, tell us. I appreciate it. And we've gotten feedback on both sides of this. Like the abortion issue was an experiment for us to see if we could take an analytical approach with the numbers, which comes from our long time in accounting and apply that to a current events story that is not directly in our space. And I think it actually stimulated a conversation. Like we got more feedback from that episode, both positive and negative and just sort of in the middle than anything we've ever done before. And our numbers are up in terms of listeners. So I guess, you know, I'm going to try harder to, when I have an opinion, to be as even keeled as I can to see both sides. That's, that's really my goal with all of this is how can I see both sides of this issue? And I try to do that. I don't always succeed, but I try. And, and again, with the abortion issue, it's funny to me because I've had people on both sides like think that I'm agreeing with them. Right. I've had like, oh, we've, we've been, been we've I, been accused. I, we've been called, time. I, we've people been accused are calling me pro Trump as Trumpers yeah. before and as crazy liberals before. We've been accused on both sides. Like, right. Which is good. Cause yeah. actually, that's actually the best scenario in my opinion, because if we do like what Donnie says is just like pick one opinion and stick with it. Now we're just going to be like this echo chamber. And the only people who are going to listen to us are the people who agree with our one opinion. And I don't think this show's yeah. not about this one opinion. Nobody wants, nobody needs that, yeah. right? You don't need me to validate your existing point of view. Regarding the PPP specifically, at the beginning, yeah, we were on it, how it wasn't, the money wasn't getting out. And then when the fraud stuff started happening, we were on that. And that's because, you know, I think our job is sort of point out the flaws. It's to, to point out what's wrong, what's going wrong, <laughs> not what's going right. You don't need us to point out what's going right. And and the whole structure of the thing from the beginning, having the SBA do the whole thing was a total cluster and was wrong. Like it should, you should not give an agency with like, what, how many people do they have? A few hundred people working there or something? This massive job. It was going to fail. And then delegating it to the banks. And like it was all designed to fail. Yeah, the whole thing. Putting on the IRS. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, of course, like, you know, like, but, but that doesn't, I don't know. We couldn't have predicted what was... I mean, we kind of did predict what was going to happen. If we went back to those shows, like we were talking about how this didn't make sense. So then the fraud is is not a surprise to me at all. Yeah. And and I think the the issue, and I've said this to other people before, because we've broken some stories. And a lot of times, and I've said this, what, what comes out of my mouth many times is something that kind of has been the word on the street for months. And sometimes I have to wait till a story comes out before I can actually say what I already knew four months ago on a lot of things. Because mm -hmm. we tend to wait till it actually becomes news. Like we are not, we are we, not TMZ. We're we're not a rumor page or rumor. We site, try not. Right? Yeah, we don't. If we hear like if we hear something from a listener and we can't substantiate it in some way, we don't talk about it. So that's that's the news element of it, right? And we try to be accurate. We don't. Unfortunately, we can't afford a fact checker yet. I hope we can get one someday, and then we can be even better. That would be really great. But yeah, you know, I think just to tie this up, right? Like my point of view is that our profession, the accounting profession is falling behind and has been behind and has in many ways is already irrelevant. There's all this talk about how accounting risks becoming irrelevant. In many ways, it already is. Like when we talk about how investors don't use financial statements to make investment decisions, that's true. It's a very small piece of it. Different surveys have different numbers, but it's like low 
single dig low double digits. You know, like less than twenty percent of investor decisions have like I'd have to pull out the number, but that's and that's because accounting standards haven't evolved. Audits have declined in value and relevance. People don't really pay attention to that anymore, and you can just see that with like the like tether not even having ever been audited and having eighty billion dollars under management as a as a crypto bank. It's crazy that this happens, and I think it's because of you know we're not staying up on this stuff, and I and, and my goal is to help push the profession forward. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. Change is really uncomfortable and being challenged is really uncomfortable as a profession. But you know, so like you, when you go to the gym, if it doesn't hurt you, you know a little bit or a lot, right? You're not you're not getting stronger. Yeah. So if when you listen to this maybe it causes you a bit of like I don't know, you listen to us and you're like those guys don't freaking know what they're talking about. Write us an email. Send us a voicemail and, and set us straight on specific issues, right? That's what I really would love. Um, and we need to figure out a way so that our listeners can give us their feedback more easily. Right now I say, email me a voice message and, and those of you do, and I really appreciate that. Like, so Donnie, next time you we say something that you don't agree with, send us a voicemail. I'll play it on the air. Just try to keep it... Um, Hopefully tweet. everybody doesn't do that. <laughs> wait, or tweet wait, at us, wait, right? Don't Actually, this is my advice for all listeners. Don't let it fester up over three or four episodes. Yeah. <laughs> let it out. Let Actually, it out, Donnie. Great. Let it out. <laughs> tweet tweet a video tweet it out. Yeah. at Cloud Accounting at the Cloud Accounting Podcast on Twitter. And, and then we can play the audio on the air. Right. And then and then we can all talk about it. I would love that. So I got one more listener message. I hate to to end on this. <laughs> no, it's okay. But I, I got it. All right, here we go. This is from Keith. I have really enjoyed listening to your podcast over the past two years. But your episode on abortion was a real disappointment and made me realize how little you care for your conservative audience. In the last episode, David made a comment that basically said, if listeners were turned off by his comments on abortion, they are free to stop listening. I have made the decision to no longer listen to your podcast. Thanks. Now, I don't think the comment you made was exactly that. I think you said well, something Well, it's, it's like you can stop and do an episode, right? That's the beauty of it. You just stop. And it's not like the olden days right. of TV where like there's two channel and you watched what came on next. Like you, this is the beauty of like a podcast. It's on demand. You listen to it. Yeah, it's not interesting. You skip it. You you pick this episode. That look. Oh, that guest looks interesting. I'm gonna listen to that one. Like that's the beauty of podcasts, and that's where it's coming from. On that, yeah. it doesn't mean don't listen forever. But this is this like we've been accused on both sides. Like so, I don't know. Right when I remember when I wrote that op ed in accounting today about Expensify and uh, David Barrett. Oh yes, because you jumped on David right? Barrett for yeah his behavior. I, I criticize I. I criticized David Barrett for writing an email and sending it out to every Expensify user, including all the clients of accountants, saying that a vote for clients of the Donald Trump and was a vote. Yeah, like it's yeah, major. That a vote for Donald Trump, and he said basically in his in his email, which was extremely aggressive, that a vote for Donald Trump was a vote against democracy. And I wrote an op-ed in Accounting Today about how that was like not only a ridiculous statement, but also totally inappropriate. And people on the liberal side jumped on me. So you know. I, I I don't consider myself to be anti-conservative. So so, so here, I, and I think the whole liberal and conservative like by like two, only two sides thing is stupid because there's so many issues where it's not that it's not two sided. And I moved to Arizona partially because I couldn't stand the lockdowns in California. So don't call me anti-conservative. You know, I'm more but, conservative than probably a, a lot of people in this country. So. Like if you, but don't label me that way either because I don't believe in these labels. So, so this is like, it, it, we're in a situation here, right? Like if you even take the feedback that Donnie just gave us, which is like, pick an opinion, take a stance and stick to that one stance. Right. And then over here. Is that what he said? I, I guess. We're being accused of having like a stance. And this guy's like, I'm out. I'm not going to listen anymore. And it's yeah. like, we don't want to be like, I don't want to be, we're just MSNBC or we're just Fox News or for lack of better examples, right? Where we just are like this one echo chamber, or the other echo chamber. We're kind of like just people in the middle. Like, like yeah. this, this is what you and I, David, like what I like about this show is you and I, if we got together and we just had a beer and we weren't recording, this is how we would be talking. And that's real. Probably, yeah, exactly. You know, we, we talk about stuff the way we talk. We, you know, we have to, uh, probably moderate a little bit of what we say well, on the math, air, right? We, we delete wanna... our math because it's horrible real time. <laughs> like, it's bad. We can't do math. So we have to delete that out of the episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and hopefully so he comes I'm sorry, back. Keith, I, hopefully he comes back. Keith, well, like, yeah, he's not listening anymore, I guess. 
but you know, I'm, I hope that if, if you were listening to our episode and you were turned off by something we said, yeah, you can just turn off the episode. I hope you come back, but also let us know what you think. Uh, I want to hear it. I want to know what your opinions are. And, um, you know, I learn from that too. I'm not perfect. Yeah. But I also don't want to optimize our show based on everybody else's opinions because that's that's what major media does, and and, and they're good at it. They like do like six minute blocks on TV and based on the ratings, and they re optimize. Oh. It's like running an optimized yeah. Facebook I ad campaign. I don't want us to be like our listeners really like that kind of story, so let's do more stories like that. Like I don't want to optimize for what the audience wants. Well, like specifically, it's more of the I don't overall. I don't think we yeah. I don't think we should optimize our opinions. So it's like, this is why I can't watch MSNBC or Fox News or CNN anymore, because they've basically figured out what their audience thinks, and then they spout opinions that match what those people think. It's just it's just it's validating juice. what yeah, you already juice, believe, yeah. right? It's just, and, it, and it gives you this good feeling or, or this angry feeling. It depends on <laughs> what the audience wants, right? Fox News it tends to be a little more like, I'm angry at, at this thing, right? And, and that's the feeling they give you. It's just a drug. So, you know, I think we're better, like, I try to listen to stuff where... Yeah, I, I disagree often, you know, like I listen to NPR because <laughs> as long as I can, um, because I think it's important for me to hear that point of view. But then I go on and I read the Wall Street Journal opinion section and I feel like it kind of balances itself out and I'm pissed at both of them sometimes, <laughs> you know, I get, I get so tired of the like world is ending, everything is horrible tone of voice that you hear on NPR stories. And then, you know, I, I feel like I read the Wall Street Journal. It's like the, the two old guys from the Muppets in the opinion section, That's right? Good. Like You mean us. <laughs> we, like, we are the, uh, if anybody wants to do the Photoshop no, no, contest, like, we are the like, two old guys. We are the two Muppets. We are those becoming no, those no. guys. Like, I just have to give you an example of like the most grumpy old man headline on the Wall Street Journal that just killed me. It was like, what's that new telescope that's out there that's like giving us all these great pictures of the world? It's named after the, the some NASA, James Webb. James Webb. Yeah. So the headline was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, something like, James Webb Telescope proves that we don't need humans to explore outer space. And basically saying, like, it's a waste of money to send people into space to explore, right? Because we can just do it with robots. I'm like, oh, man, that's so depressing, right? Like, you know, isn't there something to be said for, like, landing a man on the moon or, like, taking somebody to Mars? That headline like, it's just, is just... this. Because of AI, we do not need accountants anymore to do taxes. Like, that's the same headline. That's the same headline. Uh, Accountants are not necessary. And, you know, I do hope that uh, like AICPA invites us to one of their conferences because, you know, unlike the mainstream accounting press, we have opinions and we will question what they're doing. And actually, I would say that's an important part of journalism that we do, right? We may not always get the facts right because we, we but, but we do ask questions but, and we challenge even i just said people. like that article today they had the wrong stuff in the article so like even reporting yeah. other people's news has missed incorrect facts like right but i'm saying we go to the conferences and we don't just like like repeat talking points from that event we try to actually ask questions and and challenge the people there and that's good journalism too so like but but i i think that you know aicpa didn't want us doing that because guess what it's inconvenient to have people challenging your point of view yeah i mean but at the same time like so. i said going rewinding back to the ppb thing we are the reason they do a weekly webinar for their members we are 100 percent of that reason because they couldn't just have us only being the only voice out there which is fine that it's good for everybody i'm so glad they're doing yeah. it. it's actually decent yeah. so but and i hope we get more voices out there right like and so that's what we're doing with earmark is creating more shows donnie if you want to have your own podcast where you get to talk your opinion and maybe more people will listen, will produce it. Like, I think that's important. I, I don't want to be on another podcast. I, I'm more than happy to help produce other podcasts. Yeah. We want to bring more people's voices into the profession and visible in the profession. I don't want it to just be the CEO of your state society or Eric S. Gerson or... Uh, <laughs> so I'm bringing the accounting uh, trends, right? Like, here's the opinion. Yeah. Here's the views. Here's the journey of two 22-year-old females that are becoming accountants. One's going to CPA, one's yeah. going to public, one's going to private. They're the first Gen Zs 
entering the workforce, like it is a different view of our industry, listening to them talk about it. And it's not our, you know, two white dudes view. Like I'm very conscious of that. Like there needs to be other opinions and making other shows is the way to bring more opinions. There should be lots more. In the yeah. grand scheme of things, there's what, 1.6, 1.8 million accounts and bookkeepers in North America. I don't know how you want to count it, right? Millions, yeah. None listen to podcasts yet. There's so much room for all your coworkers and the people you know that work in this industry that don't listen to podcasts. Yes, they all should listen to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. You should tell them that. But there will be a bell curve of podcasts for them to listen to depending on where they are in their career and what excites them. Maybe it's an audit podcast. Maybe it's a Fed tax podcast. Who knows, right? There's going to be something for everybody to listen to. But everybody should listen to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. <laughs> that's, that's the only required thing everybody should do. David, if people want to reach out to you online, follow you, where should they, they do should that? They should just email Blake at BlakeOliver.com. <laughs> <laughs> No. Follow him at, at David Leary. I'm, I'm, I am at Blake T. Oliver. I'm on all the socials, just at David Leary. Super easy. <laughs> See you here next week, right, David. Bye. Time for the classifieds. Tired of clients not remembering to get W9s? Get W9 automates and streamlines the collection and storage of W9s. Get W9 has a QBO integration, and they have a partner program that pays 25% commissions. Get W9 plans start at only $19 a year. Visit getw9.tax today to get started. That is G E T W9 dot tax. Are your bookkeeping clients driving you crazy asking the same questions over and over? They need QuickBooks training and you have more important things to do with your time. Let RoyalWise be your training partner. Create your own customized client training program and outsource your QuickBooks training department. Listeners of this podcast are invited to join our partner program and receive a 10% referral commission when you sign up. Join us at royalwise.com slash partner to learn more and get started today. Again, that's royalwise.com slash partner. Hey, podcast listeners, it's Blake, and I wanted to let you know about a new show I'm working on with CPA slash comedian Greg Kite and blogger slash former CPA Caleb Newquist. It's called Oh My Fraud. And it's a podcast all about financial crimes. That's right. A true crime podcast for accountants by accountants. Caleb and Greg are going to come together every couple weeks to unpack their favorite frauds and explore the circumstances, psychology, and interpersonal dynamics involved. They also fully indulge in victim blaming the defrauded widows, orphans, infirm, and feeble-minded because who can resist? If you fancy yourself a trusted advisor or prefer your true crime with spreadsheets instead of corpses, Listen to this show to learn what to watch out for and to keep your clients, your firm, and even yourself safe. To subscribe, go to ohmyfraud.com or search Oh My Fraud on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.